Okay, so a lot has happened over the last few days, and I want to help you understand and process it. My name is Darren Gertis. I'm a professor. I've been tracking what's going on in Ukraine since almost the first few days of the war. I've been doing these videos since day 85, every day tracking what's been going on. So as you know, yesterday what happened was that the Kerch Bridge was actually, there was an explosion. We don't know exactly how it was blown up. Um, maybe they'll say that there was a cigarette that was carelessly uh, thrown around. That was a joke going back to the Moskva. Um, uh, maybe it was something else we don't know. Um, it was a day after Vladimir Putin's birthday, so there were a lot of memes floating around like this. Oh, by the way, stay till the very end. I'll show you my two favorite memes uh, floating around about the Kerch since this. It, some of them were pretty good. So, um, let's go back. It was his birthday and, um, <laughs> Lukashenko, uh, he, this guy's a piece of work. He, uh, gave, uh, Putin a, a, the very best model of Belarusian tractor for his birthday as if he needs it. And if that, as if that matters, I think this was just kind of a marketing piece so that he could, you know, talk about his Belarusian tractor anyway. So the next day the bridge gets hit. And so Russian divers are now inspecting the Crimean bridge, uh, to determine what was going on. The divers are going to exa examine the this extent of the damage caused by this explosion. It looks like a truck bomb. Some of you uh, have uh, told me, they showed me pictures and said this couldn't have been a truck bomb because, and talked about how the, the road would implode this way as opposed to that way. I am not an expert. I can't tell you anything more about that. You know about more about it than I. I just don't know. So please understand. That's why I won't be going into that ground. On Saturday night, the city of Zaporizhia, Ukraine's southeast, uh, 17 people were killed. It actually was reduced to 13 people. The 17 was the first uh, thought, uh, and then they revised it um, because uh, Putin sent a retaliatory strike. And I'll talk about why that's important in a moment. Conceivably, the Russians can rebuild it, the bridge, uh, but they can't defend it while losing a war, said a policy analyst at Chatham House, which is a British think tank. That's really interesting. So they can rebuild it, but they can't defend it in the middle of the war. They're going to have to devote so many resources to it. Um, I think that's that's really uh, an amazing statement. Okay, here's the Russian strike. And so what, what Putin could have done, he could have gone nuclear. He could have used some kind of chemical agents or biological or something along those lines, assuming he had those. And I'm pretty sure he does. Uh, but he didn't. And so I see this as a great thing in one regard. It's terrible in another regard. It's terrible that this happened. Look at the destruction here. Okay. Um, five homes were destroyed around this uh, apartment. So there was a, an apartment complex and I'll show you that in a moment. Five homes around it, 40 were, dam were destroyed, 40 were damaged, 13 were killed, another 89 were injured in this process. Um, and now that that's all terrible. That's tragic. But the good news is this is all Putin did as a retaliatory strike. This is an average day in Ukraine lobbing missiles into a residential apartment complex or the neighborhood. Like he didn't do any more than that, which I found very, very surprising. Rail services and partial road traffic resumed the day after the blast. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is you're in their heads now. This was a psychological warfare that was just, it was amazing. Uh, because the Russians never thought that this could happen. So the Russian aircraft launched at least 12 missiles, partially destroying a nine-story apartment block, leveling five other buildings, damaging many more, said the governor on state-run television. Zelensky condemned the attack as absolute evil by people he called savages and terrorists. Okay, by any means, they're war criminals, because attacking a residential block is... That you're hitting innocent civilians, that's a war crime by any definition. This is what it looks like. This is the residential block. Uh, these are some early photographs. Okay, some pretty nasty stuff happened to it. Here's some more. Al Jazeera did a good job with this as well. And that's the damage. That's a scale of the damage that you're seeing. There's more. This is the major residential apartment. Uh, like, wow. So it's pretty bad. But you know what's even worse? When you think about it, why are they attacking their own citizens? And what I mean by that is this. Russia just said, here, we've taken all of Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk, Herzan. Zaporizhia, this city that they attacked, they're attacking their own. And didn't they just say just a week ago that they would defend every inch of this territory? So 
it would have made more sense if they had struck at Kiev or struck at uh, Lviv out in the West or something along those lines, but they struck at Zaporizhia within their own so-called declared territory. That's So they're striking at Russia legally is the way that they would see it, but it, it's bizarre. Um, so, okay. So enough with that. Um, let's talk about uh, some fun with Russian state media. So here we go. Uh, RT, Belarus accuses Ukraine of planning an attack. Belarus has accused Ukraine of planning to conduct a strike against the neighboring state. Now, they don't want to involve Belarus and draw them in, but uh, they do want to be defensive. Kiev's for, uh, foreign ministry said on Sunday dismissing the claim as a ploy by Moscow to stage a provocation, which is probably what it was. The ambassador was summoned on Saturday night to the Belarusian foreign ministry and was served with an official note saying that, quote, Ukraine is planning to conduct a strike on the territory of Belarus. Uh, so the ministry went on to uh, say that Ukraine has never done this, urging the Belarusian authorities to, quote, cease kowtowing to the Kremlin's whims and immediately stop supporting Russia in its aggression. But Lukashenko, he's like a, a B-list Hollywood celebrity that just is trying really, really, really hard to be relevant. Uh, he noted that Kiev had amassed 15,000 troops near the border while setting up positions and conducting reconnaissance against Belarusian military. Yeah, that's because they have to make sure that they don't invade from your territory ever again, which is what you did the first time. Now, Lukashenko insists that while Minsk is taking a part in Russia's military operation, its role is limited. He said Belarus is preventing the conflict from spreading into its own territory while making sure that nobody would shoot Russians in the back while they're getting out into his territory. So really, uh, the Belarusian defense ministry also stated that it has the capacity to field 500,000 trained troops if the need arises. Now, I highly doubt that the Belarusian troops are exactly crackerjack. I, this shouldn't be a problem. Lukashenko is trying to support Putin, but he's really... I, his his capacity is so anemic and he acts like he's like Conan the Barbarian. Anyway, okay, let's go on to the next. Um, okay, this was actually pretty informative, but I don't trust it because it's RT. So here's RT talking about the Crimean bridge blast, what we know. So take this with a grain of salt. Russia's National Anti-Terrorism Committee said that the truck blew up as it was traveling along the 19-mile structure. That the bridge is 19 miles long. It's taller than the than the at some points. It's taller than the uh, uh, Statue of Liberty. Uh, CCTV appears to back up the conclusion that it was a truck bomb, but we don't actually know. Uh, where did the truck come from? According to Russian news outlet MASH, the truck traveled across Russia's. Uh, Krasnodar region. Now, where is that? I'll show you on a map. And so here is uh, Google Maps. Here is uh, Crimea. And this is the Krasnodar region. So it actually came from Russia across. I thought it was going out from Crimea into Russia, but it's going into Crimea. Okay. Uh, now, this is really interesting if it's true. According to the Bosna Telegram channel, the vehicle was owned by a Russian national identified as Samir Yusubov. Yusubov. Now, it's a Russian national, not a Ukrainian. Yusubov claimed that he is not even in Russia right now, and the truck was lent to his uncle, who was in transportation. The man said that his uncle took a transport order from a website without providing any further details. Now, if what happened happens as I think it did, this is absolutely brilliant, um, because the Russian national didn't know what he was transporting, didn't know the thing was going to blow up. And I, I feel bad for the guy, right? I, I don't want anybody, any innocent, to blow up. But at the same time, like... This was really clear thinking on the parts of whoever set this thing up, if this is what happened. Russian Business Daily, uh, RBK, claimed that the driver might have been unaware of what the truck was carrying. He supposedly received a fertilizer transport order, it reported, citing a security source who added that he was allegedly kept in the dark. I don't know if that's true or not because it's RT. And so if it was a Western news outlet, I'd say, yeah, maybe there's something to it here. Uh, just take it with a grain of salt. It's one of the theories and I'm not into conspiracy theory. So I don't just go, yes, that's what it was. Okay. So next Trump calls for immediate Ukraine peace talks. Again, this is also in RT, but this one actually frightens me. Um, and that's for, for two reasons. Okay, the former U.S. president says nothing will be left on the planet unless the conflict settled. Former U.S. president Donald Trump has warned that the World War III could break out unless the conflict with Russia and Ukraine quickly ends with a peace settlement. Now, I'm a Republican, okay? Trump is a Republican. 
I'm a Reagan Republican, though. I'm, I'm a little bit different than his brand of Republican. So Reagan Republicans still remember when Ronald Reagan called the Soviet Union the evil empire, and we're more inclined to be involved in the rest of the world because we realize that there is a spreading effect unless you can capture a contagion. Trump Republicans very often can be isolationist. They don't, they're not always, but they tend to be more isolationist, more America first. And I'm America first, right? I'm an American, I'm America first, but not isolationist. So that's already Trump's fundamental disposition. But he also has to set himself as different from Biden. And so because Biden has been so hawkish, if Trump takes a step, uh, you know, to the other side, trying to differentiate himself, it could be bad. It could probably split the party. And that may be where it goes. I know that some of you don't care about internal American politics, but that's potentially what might happen. Quote, and now we have a war between Russia and Ukraine with potentially hundreds of thousands of people dying. Trump says we must demand the immediate negotiation of a peaceful end to the war in Ukraine, or we will end up in World War III and there will be nothing left of our planet. Now, those friends of mine that are very pro-Trump say exactly this kind of thing. And it, it frightens me for two reasons. One, because he could actually bring the party kind of that way. Now, Republicans are very similar to Democrats in their support for Ukraine in general, but the leader of the party, and he's the most recent leader of the Republican Party, could actually kind of push people that direction. The second issue here is um, that he's kind of following a you know, what, what Putin wants to be said. And you see this in like India and China and African nations saying, we, we want peace, we want peace. No, don't fall into that trap. And I, I hope Trump doesn't go down that path. So President Putin has accused Kiev's backers of nuclear blackmail by making statements about the possibility and admissibility of using weapons of mass destruction against Russia. And this is a recurrent theme, like the world is out to get Russia. I mean, that's the way that Putin sees the world. And then they say the funniest line I've seen in almost any RT article. Some Western officials have interpreted Putin's speech as a threat to use tactical nuclear weapons. It's not interpretation, man. He said this on dozens of occasions that he might be open to using this if he needs to. So it's not like maybe they misread it. Okay. At any rate, that's what's going on there. Okay. I promised you two really funny memes. So here's the first one. Crimea Bridge conducts a special underwater operation in search of the Moskva. I thought, wow, that's somebody, somebody was cold when they wrote that one. And then the second one, which I thought was just ridiculously funny was Putin's table urgently deployed to Crimea to replace the Kerch Bridge. I don't know if you remember early on in the war, he was having a diplomatic meeting with, uh, I think, um, uh, the French president or the German president, or maybe both, but he was sitting at this obscenely long table and it was just absurd. Like, were you going to shout across the table in order to, or is it was just kind of to show his dominance? In days past, I've thanked my audience for, at the very end, for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine. As I move forward, and this goes back to yesterday, talking about monetization or demonetization on YouTube and what's happened to a lot of Ukrainian bloggers, I'm going to say this. I do not exploit, condone, or dismiss the war. Okay? I'm also going to say this. I seek peace. I call on Russia to return illegally annexed Ukrainian land. Thank you for your time. I'll be back tomorrow.